What's good with the YouTube or Convict's perspective? It's your boy, Big Flacco. Smashing, dashing, sliding on through with a little bit of energy, man. We're going to get straight to it, man. We've done a lot of discussions about a whole lot of different groups, but we're going to be talking about one particular group that started around the late 70s to early 80s, the Nazi lowriders, man. We got an interesting article, man, but I'm going to interject with a little bit of different facts. Then we're going to go over it and give it a convict's perspective from our personal perspective. No doubt, man. Uh, this little history is based on a report by SPLcenter.org. And uh, the title of it is The Nazi Lowriders Boost Over 1,000 Members, Mostly in Prison. And this is the author is Camille Jackson. The young inmates in the Nazi Lowriders, a group well known for violence and drug trafficking, made an alliance with the white supremacist Aryan Brotherhood and took on both their extremist ideology and their notoriety. In the late 1970s, a youthful and remarkably violent neo-Nazi gang, the Nazi Lowriders, or NLR, began to emerge behind the prison walls of the California Youth Authority. Founded by John Stinson. I'm going to interject there. So everybody knows John Youngster Stinson, man. He's a, he's a known AB. Um, was there in Brotherhood for years. I not, I've talked to different people who are uh, have been NLR members and associates. And there's no strong supporting uh, uh, documents, even though the uh, Department of Justice claims that he's a founder. I don't know if he was a member at all of, of the NLR, whether he was in YA or when he hit prison. The, spec the speculative membership, right, of who started the NLR were three individuals of what I hear from. Smiley Miley and Dog from Paramount, as well as Evil from Long Beach. Now, I, I can't confirm nor disconfirm, so here's a disclaimer. I do not know if John Stinson ha had any type of uh, uh, membership or any type of developments of the NLR, but I just want to be clear from my resources, I've been told differently that he was not the founder. All right. According to the article, founded by John Stinson, a white supremacist inmate, the group made an exception that appeared to run counter to their staunch white power beliefs they allowed a relatively small number of Latinos to join. Yeah. Latinos not only boosted the size of the group, they also did much of the dirty work, trafficking drugs like highly addictive methamphetamines inside as well as outside of prison. In recent years, the NLR has spread from the California Youth Authority into the adult prison populations of California, as well as several other, <laughs> as well as several other states. Today, Gang experts estimate that it has 1,000 active members, most of them behind bars in California, Arizona, Nevada, Utah, Oklahoma, Illinois, as well as Florida. Members are primarily recruited in juvenile and adult prison facilities while in their teens and early 20s. Despite the NLR's avowed racism, Latino last names and Latino wives and girlfriends are okay, but experts say, Members are supposed to be at least half Caucasian. All must show loyalty to the white race and subscribe to the ideology of hatred, especially against blacks and race traders. NLR members have been behind most of the, some of the most disturbing hate crimes in California. Last April, NLR members were charged with the kidnapping and murder of a bi man in Salinas. I don't want to say the whole thing, but bi, figure it out. In 1999, two Lancaster NLR members attacked an African-American Walmart employee with a hammer, nearly killing him. Years later, in the same town, another member used a baseball bat to savagely beat an African-American teenager on the streets. In 1995, teenage NLR members located in Lancaster, California, beat a homeless man until he passed away behind the McDonald's. 1999, Police in the town of Ontario, California, a city that had been particularly hard hit by NLR crimes, realized that they could not fight the gang alone and created what was, became known as the Multi-Agency Nazi Lowrider Task Force. The team gathered intelligence, pinpointed strongholds, and tracked down fugitives from within the NLR using the help of the FBI, ATF, State Department of Corrections, and other local police departments. Ultimately, the task force generated more than 200 arrests on state charges, 
as well as 13 arrests on federal charges, sending many of the remaining gang members underground. The charges range from drug trafficking to witness tampering, as well as murder. In 2003, after four years of investigation, indictments were finally handed down against several NLR leaders for alleged violations of RICO, also known as the Racketeer Influence and Corrupt Organizations Act, a law originally designed to attack the Italian mafia and organized crime in general. We effectively took the legs out from under this organization, said McBride. Did we wipe them out completely? No, that's not realistic. Working for the Aryans, experts are quick to point out that most NLR crimes that occur outside prison walls are related to the drug trade and that members operate more like a criminal enterprise than an ideological motivated hate group. 99% of crimes are done for the benefit of the gang, said Corporal David McBride of the Ontario Police Department. Very seldom will we see a race-based crime by the NLR. Members do their crimes at night, using methamphetamines to keep going. <laughs> mm -hmm. According to Walter Bowman, a hate crime and domestic terrorism expert, NLR members often can be identified by their tattoos, ranging from the letters NLR in Old English script to symbols like the swastika and SS lightning bolts. Many have the letter, letters NLR tattooed in their eyebrow or on their neck. Not like other groups, there are no strict rules regarding tattoos. Devil horns, demons, and Nordic runes are just as likely as more obviously Nazi-related tattoos. NLR members, experts say, are remarkable for their propensity for violence, a propensity that has resulted in numerous crimes, especially in California's small desert communities. True. That and their talents as drug dealers, both on the streets and in the prisons and juvenile facilities, brought them attention from the older, more serious criminals. Leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood, also known as AB, the largest, most serious, and most violent white supremacist prison gang in the nation. Officials with the California Department of Corrections were actively seeking to break up the AB, isolating the majority of its incarcerated members in segregation. This lockdown, made possible by AB's official designation as a prison gang, made it difficult for Aryan Brotherhood members to transact their business, which often involved major drug deals. Experts say the NLR founder Stinson sought an alliance with the AB around this time. The result was that the NLR, which had not been yet declared a prison gang, began carrying out the AB's drug business as sort of junior partners. In this relationship, the older, more frightening leaders of the Aryan Brotherhood called the shots, even as they were theoretically isolated from other inmates. AB leaders for existence instructed their NLR Aaron boys not to get into drug debt to members of other races. Most drug profits were funneled back to the Aryan Brotherhood. A side benefit was that the members of the AB who are supposed to refrain from drug use as part of their white supremacist ideology were able to avoid direct contact with the drug world. Still, the differences between the NLR and the AB with its stricter white supremacist beliefs caused some tensions within the NLR. Present officials have noticed two factions in the Nazi lowriders. One yep. that supports its older, partially Latino membership and another that only wants pure white members along the lines of the Aryan Brotherhood. Michael Snake Bridge, a 36-year-old serving a sentence for attempted murder, witness intimidation, and narcotics trafficking, has pushed for the NLR to abandon its alliance with the AB. However, another NLR leader, known as Joseph Blue Lowry, has adopted an AB-style line, calling for cleaning drugs and race traders from the group. Rick Eaton, an expert on hate groups with the Simon Wensenthal Center in Los Angeles, says the NLR is now facing the same kind of heat that the AB has for decades. The NLR has been declared a prison gang and officials are taking advantage of that designation to put its in prison members in segregation. As a result, the NLR already staggering from the 2003 convictions of several of its leaders is doing much as the AB did in the late 90s, making alliances with smaller groups 
that can help it maintain its role in the drug trade. Public Enemy Number One, also known as Peni, founded by inmate Donald Popeye Maza, now 33 years old, has about 200 members, shares NLR as well as the AB's racist background, and specializes in drug dealing and identity theft, experts say. Commonly known as Peni, the group has picked up where the NLR has been forced to leave off, carrying out gang jobs at the behest of AB and the NLR. At times, experts say all three groups, AB, NLR, and PNI, have worked together or in various combinations in the drug trade. Like the NLR, PNI involves some serious players. Maza, for example, was convicted in 2003 for the attempted murder of a drug informant. Prosecutors say Maza stabbed the victim while Dominic Droopy Rizzo, 35, held him down. AB member Albert Big Al Sherwin, 45, is believed to have overseen the attack. Officials say another P9 member, inmate Devlin Gazzo Stringfellow, 34, is also an NLR member and takes orders from Bridge. Unfortunately, even in a lockdown, they can still conduct business and get message out, messages out. McBride says of the segregated AB and NLR prison leaders, communication still continues. P9 may be headed down the same path as the NLR, which allies itself with the older, more serious AB as a way of protecting itself and trying to ensure the group's future growth. Stinson did this as an experiment and it failed, Bauman said of the allegiance engineered by NLR's founder. He probably thought that the connection with the Aryan Brotherhood would take the heat off of them. However, that did not work. Interesting. John Stinson guy is, is was caught up in an AB indictment, man. So um, I don't know if he was a member, but it sounds like he was possibly a member or very influential NLR. I don't know. I, I haven't been able to find that out, but I do know he's an AB current. I do know he eventually became Aryan Brotherhood. Um, you know, the history of, of the Nazi lowrider, from my understanding, man, they started about the late 70s, early 80s. And um, mainly they were, you know, Caucasian young males and uh, that were from down south and they adapted that that nazi culture along with the lowrider culture as far as they're kind of like their their relationship with a lot of the southern hispanics down south the chola look so a lot of the nlrs that that i first spent over the years man they had the, the high socks you know what i mean the, the pants down the flipped up hats you know what i mean and you know the button buttoned up shirts these were all the dudes that at first back in the 90s when we were in the yards with these nlrs that's how they acted man and um I think around um, they started validating them around 1998, 99. They went through a a, a, a severe uh, a validation process where they locked down the NLRs everywhere and were validating them. And during that process, man, the the NF took a very uh, they started to pay attention to them. Um, they started to look at them as like junior area and brother members. Whereas before in the 80s and 90s, when the NLR, they, yeah, they were nuisance out there in the yard. They were not really deemed a threat by the NF. And I remember around 1998, 99, we had a filter come out from Pelican Bay that the same way we were not supposed to walk any main lines with any identified Mexican mafia members or Aryan Brotherhood members, we were no longer to walk the yards with NLRs. And so with that, there was a wave of violence for those that were left out there in the main lines. So anybody that was coming, there was dudes that got, like I noticed a dude named Sparky from San Jose that had NLR, he got hit in Quentin. A lot of these guys may have became NLR members in Hawaii when they were young, right? And really no longer associate with the group, you know? And next thing you know, because they have that NLR tattoo, they hit our county jail, we're whacking them. They hit our prison yards, we're whacking them. Because that was the whole implementation of, of how we had, especially with the NLR members from down south, man. Every time I met an NLR member from down south, and I've been around a lot of Aryan Brotherhoods as well. I've been around uh, Pirate. I've been around Buzzard. I've been around Tank. I've been around all these AB members. They were always respectful towards us. Straight killers, but never were never ha had any type of hostilities. Whereas most of the NLR members I met that were from down south, they had an obvious hate towards Northerners, man. They hated us more than I felt the Sudanios hated us. That was the vibe I got. I would agree. I haven't been around a lot of them. I got to know one pretty well. You know what I mean? And uh, he turned out to be an all right dude. You know what I mean? But he was already away from that, you know, sort of lifestyle when when I crossed paths with him. 
And I actually, I actually hung out with him a couple of times on the streets and he was cool. There's no mistake about him, even though he walked away, he wasn't playing, bro. There was no, you, I mean, you know, you run into them people, you've been around long enough where you know right away, you got to keep an eye on this dude. He was one of them dudes, bro. Hey, and don't get me wrong, straight dope fiend as well, but he was not playing, bro. He was one of them dope fiends that, you know, you can't just talk to him like a dope fiend. You got to respect him because he'll cut you there. They'll go all the yeah. way. There's no doubt about it. And, uh, you know, I started first hearing about them dudes really in 96. You know, I knew they were around, but they weren't, like you said, they weren't really viewed as so much of a threat, you know, as the, the AB would have been viewed. They were just a little, they were about that action. There's no taking that away. Yeah, they, they were. started coming out in the 90s, man, early 90s, mid 90s, and then really 98, 99, right around there. They became a handful, man, in places like High Desert, a lot of them level fours. Everybody putting in work on that side of the fence, you know, the, the white side, man, they were Nazi go riders back then, bro. Those were the ones that when they were on the yard, you 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 paid attention to them. You you know, we're always aware of our surroundings, our enemies, you know, their movements behind enemy lines, et cetera. That's part of our training. I keep more of an eye on them personally than I ever would the Southsiders just because to me, the NLRs were more unpredictable. You know what I mean? They didn't have, when you, when you've been dealing with nothing but homies and, and, and the gentlemen from down South, you get to realize patterns and things like that, man, them NLR dudes were liable to do anything at any time. They had, no, yeah. they weren't predictable. You know what I'm saying? They could be, everything could be perfectly fine anywhere. And I've heard this from a lot of different people then all of a sudden it wasn't fine no more just for no reason there was no you know usually when groups go at it there's a kickoff factor there's an argument there's a perceived disrespect you know there's some money involved there's something involved with them dudes man it could kick off on valentine's day bro you know what i'm saying they didn't, they were they were a trip bro the big issue that was going on though people don't realize is in the 90s you remember in the 90s you could be sold up with someone that wasn't validated you know what I mean? You could be validated up in the Bay and sell up with a non-validated. So in the 90s, a lot of NLR members, people will remember this, were being hung in their cell by AB members. There was a big conflict going on for a minute, and that's where you had the split of the AB at that time. I'm not the AB with the NLR. Some aligning under the ABI ideologies, some with the old ideologies. You know what I'm saying? Because there's been, there's been um, several Hispanic NLR members one that's really well known was an individual named Scarecrow from IE, Hispanic. There was also a Samoan, Samoa Pete, an LR member. So they had a lot of people that were, see that, I don't know where the name Nazi came, came through because when I think Nazi, I think white purists. I think I'm not dealing with Mexicans. I'm not dealing with blacks. I'm not dealing with anything. And I know the whites beliefs, it's okay to interact with Hispanics, but not blacks. I've been told that by many of them. That's just an ideology that, that they have. You know what I'm saying? So when all that, okay, so with the, with the Aryan Brotherhood, we, what we, we realized, right, is around the late 80s and 90s, they had lost a lot of control on these main lines. Um, they didn't have a strong presence. So the, the AB did the smartest thing, and I've talked about this several times. They put all these small splinter groups, like P9, Warrior Skinheads, Sacramaniacs, Wolfpack, NLR. They started rec under, recruiting undercover members as AB, right in order to build those alliances so that they're all under their umbrella and that's what happened with the nlr is the nlr was one of the main priority factions that was pushing the ab's agenda later on p9 got involved as well in other groups that fell under their umbrella but that was a, that was the main thing that the ab was able to do because there's not really that many ab members you know um they've they've gone through a recruitment frenzy in the last 20 years but I, I'm going to tell you, probably in, in the 90s, there's probably only maybe about 40, 50 members. And they took they took the best plan of action was to get all these smaller groups. Yeah. And the NLR was one of them. Now, I mean, the NLR was putting in work. I got off with a couple of cats from NLR in Solano, Tommy Guns and Spider. You know what I mean? We got into a big old issue. And the thing that I used to realize, man, what used to trip me out was the NLR was mainly from down south. But they had NLR members that were from up north that grew up kicking it with homeboys, but because of geographic, but because of politics, 
they became NLR members. And that kind of changed a little bit as far as the relationships. Like I knew uh, Sidewinder from uh, Santa Rosa, Loki from Santa Rosa, uh, Marcus from Coco County, a whole bunch of other cats that were in NLR, man. And it was a trip how the ones from, even I felt like they were getting the bad end stick because they were from up north. They play their favoritism roles as well, man. And I always used to used to notice that the NLR members that were from down south would always want to control, and they always had a conflict within each other, it seemed like. Yeah, hey, what you were saying about when, when they were doing the, the, the choking, strangling, whatever you want to call it, that's what brought them to our radar real strong was in 96 and C12, that dude uh, spun. He got he got whacked in the cell, you know, by, by a piece of rope. And uh, he was left in his cell for like 48 hours. You know what I mean? I think I've told the story where, you know, the AB dude, I think his name was Steve Oliveris, took him out of the cell and <laughs> set him up when he went to the yard and said his cell he needed to see the MTA. And he was already gone for like a day and a half, two days. And he was just getting his food. And that's also what started the four o'clock count. I don't know if a lot of people know that, but that one right there, you know, when they investigated and, and, and looked at the time of the time of death, they're like, man, it's 40 hours, 45 hours, whatever it was. They're like, how do you guys not notice? Because they used to be able to sleep, you know, through the count. They just checked your body to make sure you didn't escape. It's like, well, for one, in the Pelican Bay shoe, you're not going to escape. It's impossible without like like a damn Navy SEAL team coming to from the outside to assist you. It's not going to happen. You are never going to escape from the Pelican Bay shoe. It's just not feasible. So uh, with that one, that's what really got, man, I know Tibbs in D.C. for sure, what really started making them pay attention to the men LR dudes because with that, you know, that removal, the ultimate removal, they were wondering, well, these guys must pose a threat to the, to the bigger group, the A.B., or they wouldn't be whacking them. So let's find out more and more and more about this group. And that, that's kind of what set that off was that one killing in C-12. You know, the FBI came in and tried to question people. It's like, bro, wasn't even in our pod. Get, get, you know, beat feet. You know what I mean? Don't don't stand by our door. But uh, there was a couple of them, man. I don't remember all the instances, you know, verbatim and names and stuff, but there was a few where the they beat whacked them guys, you know? And you know what? I think these articles are are kind of far their reach, because I don't believe that the Aryan Brotherhood is is a racial motivated group. You know what I'm saying? I think that they're a criminal organization. Yeah. You get what I'm saying? Because if you're if you're a pure pure racist group, Nazi, I I always used to question this, and I've seen someone else do a spill on it before, man. And then how could you have alliances with other groups that are not of your ethnic background if you're a, a uh, uh, against race trading, you, why would you have Hispanic girlfriends and all that? If you're about your your pu purity of your race and separation from all other groups, then how could you align with the Sudanians and Emmy? You know what I mean? I, I was kind of questioning that, man, as well as the, the Nazi name. You know what I mean? Like, you know, that swastika means hate. You know what I mean? I used to kind of trip on that a little bit. Like, you know, people are putting things on them, not realizing, and yet they're associating with other groups like that, man. I, I kind of used to always question that, like, well, Shouldn't these guys just hate all races, Mexicans, Iranians, Asians, Blacks? You know what I mean? Get their, they're chilling on the yard, kicking it with the South Sliders, you know, drinking coffee off each other. I never understood that. You know what I mean? So I think, I think the, the, uh, uh, it was just a whole nother way of them putting things out there. You know what I mean? To me, man, I think that that, that type of ideology, man, is, is used more so as a recruitment tool and is accepted, you know, for their certain members to harbor those type of feelings it's totally fine and encouraged but it's also a recruitment tool you know for uh let's call them angry white young kids you know what i mean that you know that might be having frictions with other ethnic gangs you know what i mean and just hey you know we're going to stick together for this common goal that you know we're different than them better however they look at it you know and, and contrary to popular belief even though the, the numbers are, are fairly equal the white people are a minority in prison solely based on gang numbers. You know, yeah. you have Serenos, all Serenos are going to ride as one. You have Northerners, all Northerners will ride as one. But the whites, certain specific inmates and in certain specific groups will ride as one when it comes down and others 
aren't obligated to participate like other groups. So that makes them the minority in a sense that they're outnumbered most of the time by manpower who will actively participate in any sort of conflict. You know what I mean? So yeah. that's, things like that, man, I agree with you. It's, it's an organization that's, you know, their, their end game is money and power. You know what I mean? But the ideologies of, of superiority and all that stuff, man, I believe that's, you know, secondary, third dairy, you know, along no. the real lines of their goals. Okay, I became cool with a, with a, with a skinhead. He's my neighbor, right? And uh, uh, he told me, you know, he, his name was uh, Little Red. He was a warrior skinhead, right? Been on all level four shoe yards. He was put in the hat by the brand for uh, a couple things, for refusing to take someone out at their directives, as well as when he was running high desert, he had everything in accordance to skinhead accord. And they sent an NLR member there from the Bay to take over. And... It, it, it was contrast to what his beliefs were, were, were for the white movement, for the skinhead movement. So he had dude hit. And so he was telling me that a lot of the skinheads in NLR were really going at it. And I remember that. They were going at it on, the, on a lot of these main yards for, for uh, supremacy on the yards because that's when you had a lot of conflict going on in these yards at that time with all these different groups, aligning with different groups. Who, who was going to be out there pushing the AB's agenda? And who was going to re refrain from it? Because a lot of the skinheads were saying, look, we're not a prison gang. We're not a prison organization. The only way to be a skinhead is to be recruited out there in the streets, they used to say. These are our beliefs. These prison politics you're pushing are your beliefs. We're going to stick in accordance to what we're, we're pushing. So I've seen a lot of these conflicts. I've seen them getting off on different yards. And at the same time that was going on with that, you also had the issues uh, um, with the MA and the AB. They got off in, in, in high desert. And I think uh, uh, the AB either spirit an MA or something happened, right? This was around 2003 because an NF filter came out 2004, letting us know that the MA and AB were at war at that time. It started in AC, and that a lot of these yards, the Sureños and white boys were getting off at that time because a lot of the white boys, NLRs, and different factions were, were, were going with this whole different process that you guys no longer dictate our program. You know what I mean? That's where the little bit of separation came between the two factions, and then the white boys started functioning with their own discipline, their own procedures. And so I actually seen that filter, man, and we were instructed that we were to stay out of this war. Let's put, let's grab the popcorn, let's eat, and let's see what happens. This skinhead was able to tell me that all the level fours, a lot of these yards, the Sureños and the white boys were getting off for the same purpose, man. So the NLR had a, had a big influence, as well as the AB changing the directions of the white boys programs and they did the smartest thing like like you said they are a minority so instead of fighting each other which they were between 98 to around 2003 they were getting off everywhere whether it be sacramaniacs uh butte county boys fame um P uh, p9 uh all these different groups were going at it with each other eventually the ab was able to do the smart thing get them all under their umbrella now, some of them have had green lights put on them, but you know how that goes. You put a green light on for about a year. We'll take it off once one of you guys fall in line. But, um, yeah, the NLR, man, definitely with the business. But I never looked at them um, like a criminal organization. I looked at them more like a gang, if that makes sense. Yeah. You know, when I think of the AB, I think of the MA, and I think of the NF, I think of criminal organization that has gang members that work for them. So I look at the NLR in the same way that you would look at like an NR member, you know what I'm saying? Or a camarada. That's where I look at the NLR. I don't think that they have any type of a, a, you know, constitution or political structure. I don't know. I could be wrong, but from my understanding, they don't. You know what I mean? I do know that each letter, and this is something that we used to look at when we were going to remove them, was they have to earn each letter. If they put NLR on them, they have to earn it. So if you see an individual come to a yard with an N or an NL, he was going to be a primary target to be, to be moved because any type of action that was going to be taken against us or any other particular group that maybe aligns, aligns with us, they're going to be the first one to do it because they're trying to earn, earn their letters. Hey, you know what, uh, you know what I developed, man, was a little tactic, man. And this is what I used to tell people to do, you know, on the main lines and stuff is, uh, we knew the, the whites were going at it. They were splintered. You know, there's a lot of different, you know, smaller groups that kind of made up one, kind of not. What I would tell them, man, is try to befriend 
somebody in one of the groups who seems like they're socially adjusted enough to, to talk to you. You know what I mean? Well, we know they're going at it, man. I'd have people trained to get in their ear and be like, hey, man, you guys are cool. But, you know, that group over there, is, you know, they're pretty disrespectful, man. And you know how you know how these politics are, bro. If it goes down, it's going to be us against y'all. And we don't want to see it just because of them guys with that in that group. Well, what that would do is cause that group to be like, well, we got this going on and we're not at war with them dudes, particularly, even though those guys don't like them. And it would create a planted animosity that's imaginary in a sense against that other group. Like, man, these guys are out here. You know, this ain't our group. They're out there causing tensions with the Northerners and all our stuff's going to be shut down and we're going to be on lockdown. And that just pokes a little bit of animosity into them that may or may not have already been there or may have added fuel to the fire against that other group of white boys. Yeah. I don't <laughs> think people, re I don't think pe people realize the white boys have a whole different, you know what I mean? You have your regular picker woods. Yeah. You have the skin. I mean, which is like, Hey brother, you know yeah, I mean? a long time, brother. Yeah. Then you got the skinheads and you got the NLR. I mean, for a minute it was a trip in Quinton. They had them separated the skinheads and in, in, in the NLR and all the NLR had shaved heads and all the skinheads had long hair. I thought it was a trip, man. Yeah. You know what I mean? But they, they got their, um, like I said, I think the NLR drew a lot of the AB's attention and what they needed to do, man, without the presence of the NLR on these yards, right? And I've heard different rumors, man. I've heard some people say that the NLR were abusing white boys out there in the yards. Some say the NLR were, were the, were the uh, front soldiers for the whites out there in the yards. I don't know. I know my experience with a lot of NLRs, the ones from up north were cool. You know what I mean? I got along with you know what I mean? Later on, when we had to hit him, it was all just a cost of doing business. It didn't mean I didn't like the dude. It was, you can't walk our main lines. The ones from down south, a lot of times, they had that natural hatred, I, I felt. Not every one of them, but you could just sense it, man. Like, I, I, maybe it was because of my, my pigment, my skin color. You know what I'm saying? I would sense the hostilities. But then I would talk to people like Casper from out there in Tulare County and, and, and other people, you know, Marcus from up north and, and all these other, and, and Loki, they were cool. They would say that, man, we fuck with you guys. I kick it with homeboys on the streets. This is just politics. Yeah. You know, but my, I still, it was kind of weird because even though they would be cool and respectful, I still deep down inside had a hard time trusting some of them, man, because like you said, they were a little bit different with the Sudanians. You knew what was coming with the Sudanians. If there was some conflict, they were just going to come and bring it right, right to your doorstep. And it was on the cracking. Whereas with them, things could be cool like they were with us in Solano. And the next thing you know, they staged an attack that we didn't see coming when they attacked me and Rascal. We didn't even see it coming. We didn't expect it. It was like about six weeks later. You know what I mean? Yeah. So, I mean, that's that's personally my experience with those cats, man. They're just way more shifty. They're shifty dudes. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Hey, one thing I'm going to say, man, just like we say about most of our adversaries, bro, they're about that action. Oh, they're about that action. Bro. NLR I mean, was not playing, probably still ain't playing. I don't know. I ain't been locked down in a while, but they're ne they were never nobody that we were just like, oh, let's eradicate them dudes like it'd be easy. Because, man, that particular group of, of, of white inmates, they were they were deadly, bro. They were deadly. They weren't playing around. Their their goal was to make the news and have you out of there in a helicopter. And there's no there's no disputing that, you know. Yeah, they were they were running those yards, man. I mean, yeah, for years secretly. You know what I mean, Whack, Whack Deuce brings it up that he said those dudes were giving him a run for his money every yard he went to, man. And that's just how they were. You know what they I mean, were, they were they were in charge of the toughest yards for their particular racial segment. Not not the ones and twos. We're talking about the fours, and we're talking about them high deserts and them Salinas valleys. They 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 were with it, bro. They were ready at any time. They were not they were not to be taken lightly. Yeah, I'm, try, I'm, I'm, I'm trying right. to. I want, I want to get more confirmation, like about John Stinson, because I asked um, Joey before we did this video if if he was the actual founder. He said that, not to his knowledge, that no. You know what I mean? So I'm hoping that someone would have a little bit more information because that's two articles that I've read that they say they claim he was the founder. I know later on he was an AB, and I'm pretty sure he had a relationship. I, I, I'm just trying to figure out if he was even an NLR or not. So I'm trying to do a little bit, I'm trying to get a little bit of information. Like you guys say, we don't know everything. I mean, we may have a lot of insights to these groups from our personal experience, but it doesn't mean that we're always going to be right, man. But 
like I said in the beginning, man, those three individuals are the ones that I've been told were the ones that started um, the NLR. Well, there it is, YouTube, man, a little bit about the NLR, their history, you know, their, their everything they got going on. Very, very influential group, you know, throughout the, especially the 90s and early 2000s. Not to be taken lightly. Remember, this is just our perspective on them. We weren't members. We don't know 100%. But uh, that's that. Have a good day. Enjoy your weekend. We'll holler at you later. It's your boy Rojo, Big Flacco, and we're out of here.